Hello, welcome to my crash course video. Then we're gonna be talking about the three major movements uh, of the time period from 1400 to about 5th, 1815. It goes a little bit past, but I mean, that's how it's divided up. So to get things started, I wanna talk about the Renaissance. And when we talk about the Renaissance, we think about art flourishing. We think about science developing. We think about philosophies deepening into our minds, but we don't, and we think about people like Galileo, Copernicus, we think about people like Da Vinci and Shakespeare, we don't think about music too much. And in fact, in my experiences of looking at the WAP and European history textbooks, I've, been, I've looked at a couple, um, there's not a lot about music, maybe half a page at most, but usually just one or two paragraphs. And I wanna talk about the music uh, influence of music music development in um, Europe during this time because personally music means a lot to me and I love to make music I love listening music I love to play music so yeah the first thing is that music what music used to be so music up to this point um, music from prior to the Renaissance and even during the Renaissance is really for a church Right? Music is something that's considered holy, it's considered something that's uh, just righteous, divine. Uh, music was used for this kind of purpose. It was used to create like an atmosphere for the ideal worship place. It, was, it, had, all, it had Latin lyrics, it had religious lyrics to, to kind of show that, you know, music is something that should, that's God-given and it's a gift of God and we should use it for God. Right, and so churches use music a lot, and we don't see a lot of music away from the church. But it starts to it starts. It starts. It's not fully developed, but it starts to get secularized in the uh, during the Renaissance. Uh, people like uh, Josquin de Prez, uh, William Byrd, and Gesualdo. These people begin to secularize music, although they were still part of church. They still made secular music because. Church is kind of the way that you get into music at this time. Really away from church, you don't really, you don't really play that much music away from the church. So it's, it's a good gateway to start your musical career at the church, that's why. Um, some of the factors of being secularized, uh, you can see through lyrics, you can see through the way that people use music now. You can see the, the way that um, uh, with the printing, with the development of the printing press, you can see that people get to have more access to this sheet music. So you can sing with your friends or play with your friends if you want to. But the biggest component is the emotional factor of it. Um, these composers use their emotions to describe, to or they use music to describe their emotions, and people can, the listeners can listen for these emotions. Right? It's the Renaissance. So there's instruments developed, right? There's a lot of different forms of instruments that are developed like the cello, the violin, the flute, the recorder, and something called the sack butt that looks like a, the today's trombone and um, the organ as well. So these kind of different instruments uh, bring in different um, sounds and uh, you know different compositions that you can do using these different instruments. and when, and. Another thing, uh, the biggest thing, in my opinion, during the Renaissance that came from Italy, because when I think of Italy, I think, or when I think of the Renaissance, I think of Italy and how Italy is flourishing and how life is good in Italy because of the economic situation and the geographical location of, of Italy. And you have all these ports and sea and, and water and all these things. And, you know, it's just life, life just looks good in Italy. So the biggest thing that came out of Italy um, during the Renaissance Music-wise, would be an opera, the, the genre of opera. I love opera, personally. I love to listen to opera. I love to go to operas. I love opera. And, and, the, and there's this one influential person named Monteverdi. Uh, he kind of connects the bridge between the Renaissance and the Baroque. Um, he creates a lot of these pieces, and he's very, very famous. I mean, even today, people are performing his pieces. And uh, the reason that he's a, co a connector is because, I mean, he was born at the right time, kind of, not gonna lie to you, but it's the factors of what or opera is. So opera has two components that lead to different, lead to music development later on. So the first thing is the emotions. I mean, it's dramatic. I mean, you hear any kind of opera, you, 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 you look at the, in, 
it's mostly about like the lifestyles of people and, and their personal life. So it's just a lot of emotion, dramatic effects. The second thing is the structure and the overall composition of the opera. So basically there's probably one singer or two singers that are singing above this um, accompaniment, right? And that's, that's kind of the structure that builds on into the Baroque and classical period. So moving on to the Baroque period, uh, music becomes more complex. Of course, there's more instruments, there's more way to play, there's better musicians now, there's better performance, there's better um, people who, better instrument, uh, better people that can play the instrument, they're getting better and better. Um, but this is the time of uh, enlightenment. So the Baroque period, about 1600 to 1750-ish there, that would be the Baroque period. It's also where the Enlightenment happened, so it's very structured, it's very mathematical. Even today, when we look at music theory classes and when we look at composition or, or, or these things, um, it's very mathematical, more than what a regular person would think. And because there's more instruments and there's more, there's, it's more complex, there's a development of the harpsichord, which is very important because it's like modern day piano, but except the, so except when the hammer hits the string, in today's piano, there's a little felt on top of the hammer that makes, that makes, that hits it and kind of mutes the string a little bit so you don't get that tangy sound of the harpsichord because the harpsichord doesn't have the felt on top or the hammer, every time you hit a note, the hammer pops up and hits a string and the harpsichord doesn't have the little felt on top. So it makes that stringy, that tangy sound. Moving on to the composers of the composers of the Baroque period, we have Vivaldi, who is very, very influential. Um, he makes a lot of different types of music. I mean, if you don't know Vivaldi, you've probably heard of his song before. It's Spring. Uh, most infamous one, the infamous one would be Spring of the Four Seasons, of course. Uh, but he played, he made a lot of music, he made a lot of sonatas, a lot of uh, church event music, he made a lot of these. And the genre of minuet comes into play, which is a 3-4 dance music. So it goes 1-2-3, 1-2-3, 1-2-3, like that. And a lot of French people danced to it, so it became very popularized. Um, and thanks to that popularization, Vivaldi kind of sparks as well. And the second um, influential person, and this is the most influential person in my opinion of the Baroque period, would be J.S. Bach. Of course, we all know J.S. Bach, so I don't have to explain too much because he's very, very famous. Um, but the one thing that I do want to talk about with Bach is that, and the one thing, the one reason that he was very successful in his art during his time was that he created this sense of musical phrasing. Right, this this sense of moving up and down, this using these scales and these notes and combining them and making it into like a centralized theme. It's not necessarily a motif because that's later on in, in the late Romantic period, but it's not a motif. It's a it's a musical phrase. It's a little bit longer than a motif, right? Besides these two, really, there's not that big named um, composers, and, and unless like it's like Handel or Telemann, but these people um, aren't like, they're, they're very, very good in their own sense, of course, but they're not influential enough that it translates onto the classical era, which we're gonna talk about next. So the classical era, fairly similar to the Baroque in the first half, but definitely, definitely a big, big change in the second half. Later on, uh, in the second half of the classical era, there's a big, big change, difference from the Baroque period. So, first things first, the scale of music increases. So, in the Renaissance and the Baroque, maybe Baroque, it was maybe it's a little bit smaller scale, but, but the classical era, there's a full orchestra now containing about 30 or 40, and, and there's even pieces that require 100 or 1,000 singers, right? So, so the scale becomes bigger. That means there's more dramatic effects that can be done. Speaking of which, uh, how classical musicians did it is different from how Baroque musicians did it, in that, um, class, in, that in, in the Baroque time period, it was, 
for example, it went from pianissimo to forte. There was like a subito, like a all of a sudden kind of feeling. Uh, but in classical music, there's more of a crescendo and a decrescendo, like a diminished. You're diminishing and you're increasing. Uh, it's not like a jump up and down like the Baroque period. It's more of the this fluidity that, that you hear throughout the music. And the first component, and the first. Uh, Composer would be Joseph Haydn. Joseph Haydn. Haydn. Um, Haydn, sorry. Uh, he's a devoted Catholic, so there was a lot of pieces where he devoted his piece to the name of the Lord. And he created this um, thing called the String Quartet, which is a devised of two violins, a viola, and a cello. So four, four instruments, court, string quartet. And this is very, very important. The second person is Clementi. He's not that, you know, he's not that talked about, but uh, he wrote music specifically for the piano, which is um, which changes from the harpsichord to the piano now. People put the felt over the hammer. Um, and of course, we can't forget about Mozart. Um, a lot of scholars say that Mozart is a genius, right? I mean, he was a genius. Uh, and a lot of scholars say that he is the most influential composer of all time, which I agree with. All 99% agree with that statement. I mean, let me, let me, let me just read you some of his uh, records here. Started playing piano at three years old, uh, first composition at four years old, first symphony at eight years old. He created his first opera at 14. I mean, 14 years old? I think that was my freshman year. 14 years old. When I was struggling in Miss Rollins' class to try to try to grind out that homework, Mozart was over here creating this opera. I mean, it, I guess it really makes me feel bad about myself, kind of. But it shows how impressive Mozart was. He created 600 plus work, 50 symphonies, 25 piano concertos, 17 sonatas, uh, just dozens of, of other pieces that, I mean, I can't even name all of them. I, have, I haven't even heard all of his pieces before. So Mozart is very, very influential. He, there's a lot more emotion, even more than Baroque. Even more than Baroque's, you know, that we thought that there was emotion into it. Because of this, again, like I said, this crescendo and decrescendo. This is very, very important, right? It's not all of a sudden change. It's a subtle change up and down, it shows that, it develops that musical phrasing that uh, Bach, had, Bach had figured out. It truly develops into an emotional thing. And the final person that I want to talk about is Beethoven, right? Beethoven is a little bit later on. He's probably the end of the classical period and uh, like, um, like a, another bridge, another bridge from classical era to what is called the Romantic era. And I'm kind of sad that we don't get to talk about the Romantic era because that's my favorite era uh, of music. I love playing that kind of things. I love Chopin and th I love Chopin and Rachmaninoff, but uh, it's kind of sad that I can't talk about the Romantic era. But Beethoven is the closest that I'm going to get to it. So here it goes. He's grown up in a classical field. He's grown up in a musical family. He's, he's not really a genius, perhaps, to say. He's not like a child prodigy like Mozart was. So he, I mean, I, I say that really lightly. I say that kind of jokingly, but I mean, he was brilliant, brilliant. I mean, of course, at first he's uh, kind of forced to play piano, but eventually he finds his passion. At 13 years old, he uh, develops his, he composes his first piece of art. Uh, his mom dies at 17, though, so he, has, he, he, he uh, helps out the family financially by giving lessons and uh, performing in places. Uh, he, uh, he studies under Haydn, which is a big influence. Uh, and the works of Beethoven is kind of crazy. I mean, it's kind of crazy even for people at, especially for people at that time, uh, where they're used to Mozart's um, major and minor, these things, but now you hear Beethoven coming in with the full orchestra coming in at the same time and, and, and unison, and it's just kind of, it's kind of all these diminished chords and all this kind of dissonance that you hear um, influenced by um, Beethoven's life, kind of his hardships. It's, it moves on to the Romantic period, uh, but yeah, that's the end of the classical period. And thank you for 
uh, giving me this opportunity to talk about music and to to boost um, to the grade that I want, Miss Parks. Thank you so much, and uh, see you later.